Much better, right? So how are we going to get there? We're going to go through isometrics. It all happens so fast we have to create that building block. So why do we do these first? Uh, we're going to fatigue out the tendon and it's going to force more MTU, unit, more MTU recruitment and for all the years I've trained, I always blew feet off till the very last, and I'd get to the end of the workout, people look tired, and I'd say, yeah, let's just skip feet, let's go home. But if it's worth 75% of what you're given, what's putting out there, I started doing them first. So we're going to do a test here, okay? Ready? We're going to stand up. What? i got to stand up and do something? Here's what I want you to do. You're going to need your table or something to hang on to because most of you are going to fail. And I'm going to turn the camera around and catch you falling and you will be on Fail Army, my favorite YouTube channel. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you to go up heels high. Okay? When your heels are up, what I want you to do is put all the weight behind the joint of your big toe. How many people are off to the side? I'm going to show you this in a second anyway. Now that you're up there, I want you to stand on one leg and see how long you can hold it. There's this woman in Australia who is a tendon expert. Her name is Jill Cook. She says you should be able to hold that for two minutes. When you can hold that for two minutes, that your body will be able to handle all the force that has traveled down through that whole chain. How many people are struggling? It's all of us, right? How many people have that little bit of pinch in your Achilles tendon and you're constantly worried you're going to blow your Achilles tendon and be that guy or girl? I'm the only one? Come on, that's all of us older guys. We don't want to be that guy. So this tendinopathy or the training of the tendon starts with this endurance. Well, once you've got the skill and you can bring your toe over, you have to build the endurance to do that. And that's what her point is. Now, I don't have my guys stand for two minutes. We try and go for a minute, but I say, hey, if you're standing in a line somewhere, go up and hold. So you want to do that frequently throughout the day. So you're getting constant, your brain is constantly telling that tendon that, hey, we can work really well. You guys can sit. We're going to be standing up again in a second. So tendon, human tendon adaptation response to mechanical loading a review by Sebastian Baum. Joint angles are really important because once you change how that knee and hip are, that tendon responds differently. And if we look at the different people accelerating and things like that, we see ankles and hips in different areas. And you can be strong in one area isometrically and move a joint a little bit and suddenly be weak. So we want to work through that whole range of motion. Type of contraction, eccentric, isometric, concentric, don't matter, but high intensity is really important. You guys all saw JL, right? You can't miss him. He's got a phenomenal grip. You know, if you deadlift 900 pounds, he doesn't use straps when he deadlifts. He literally grabs 900 pounds and picks it up with his hands. And so I was talking to him about training grip strength. Because I'm thinking, well, about the same, you have a large portion of your brain that go to your feet and a portion that go to your hands, and they're similar. Like dogs have the same front and back feet. You know, you go down the chain and, you know, there's some carryover. He said everyone who does all the endurance stuff is horrible for grip strength. It has to be short, hard duration because if you grow the muscles really big in your hand, the tendons don't work as well and he needs that tendon strength. So he goes, I know people I'm going to beat in the deadlift because when I see him doing same, you know, hard, long, I'm going to get my hands really big type things, he knows he's going to win. It's got to be the same thing with the feet. Which is why, again, isometric is great because you're not creating all this muscle growth in an area that's already compact. And there's all kinds of research out there about bigger muscle growth is going to change the way your body responds unless you're genetically built that way. And they found plyometrics had little impact on tendon response. I'm not saying get rid of them because there's going to be a purpose for them here in a second. 
And these guys found out last year that ISO training is the best for tendon change. So here's the problem. If you walk away with one thing besides the isometric exercises, this is it. Good foot, bad foot. It's like a Dr. Seuss thing. What's the next page going to say? If this is your runner, where is he pushing to go? He's pushing to go out this way. How many people, when you went up on your toe raise, felt you break to the outside of your foot and you felt the weight go to the, your, your four little toes rather than to your big toe? That's going to be about 80% of the population. Which means if you have someone that's running and they're pushing off the side of their foot and I'm working at my target this way, how am I going to make sure that I make it to my target with my vision if I'm pushing this way? I have to swing this arm because my sum of movement will be toward that target. So when you have the people say, their arms look funny when they're running, they're running like Popeye, why is that? I guarantee if you look at what their foot is doing on the ground, they are balancing out what this propulsion unit is, where it's taking them. So you can talk about pulsing and all that stuff. It's not going to matter if you're pushing somewhere else. If you pulse, you're going to break your ankle. Remember, job of brain is to stay safe. So over here on good foot, the weight is behind my big toe. I got good calves, don't I, huh? <laughs> and I'm up tall. That way I'm training the muscles to come through to my big toe. So when I push through in my movement, I'm actually coming this way, which frees up this arm to just be a swinger. I don't have to rotate because once this arm rotates, I create this rotational aspect in my sprint and I'm in trouble. How many people have the Popeye? Or the long thrower? All of it is usually compensating for this foot. Everything is a response to what happens on the ground here for the 8 one hundredths to the 0 0.11 tenths. Which makes this whole running thing that much more fascinating. You guys ready to work out? Yeah. We're going to do this together. Here are my ISO foot patterns. And I did these hardcore for six weeks. Before I start, after about week four, we started to weigh them down. But at Montini, they don't have a weight room. Did you guys know that? They won all those state championships, don't have a weight room? So we used rubber bands, or people stood on their, each other's shoulders, or you grabbed people and hung them down like that. And you have to get creative. That's why I like it at Montini. Got to be creative. Let's do this together, OK? Up. Basic foot pattern number one. And when I do these things, I like to be elevated. I don't like to do it on the floor because I think your brain knows that there's nothing underneath and it changes the response. It's just a feeling that I get when I do this. So the first one is one that we did already. You're going to come up onto that big toe. You can bring your hip up because we want to practice that finishing pattern. And you're going to hold. Now initially we'll start for a minute or go 30 seconds, but if we build that endurance up, we're going to start adding weight and we're going to go for five or six seconds and then bring it down and switch again. Because this ankle has to take a lot of body weight, but we want to get it strong isometrically. I'm not saying you've got to put 350 pounds on your back to do it, but you've got to weight it down some. And you'll see people fatigue out pretty quick. That one's pretty easy, right? Everyone can go up, do this. Weight behind, the weight is behind your big toe, kind of in between your big toe, second toe. Here's the second pattern. Now, I'm going to go to this one first. Heel up, keeping that angle in the ankle above 90 degrees, and you're going to break at the knee and the hip. Heel high. So I walk by, and if I can slide my foot underneath your foot, I know you're high enough. Which you are not, sir. Thank you. I saw you doing calf raises earlier, so I know you're in trouble. <laughs> like this? Say again? What yeah, angle that's... did you say you went at the ankle? 
above 90 in this one. Because I'm looking at the sums of the angles in the three different joints. And I want to make those changes. And there's about a 15 degree carryover in either direction where you're going to have that strength moving in one way or the other. The next one is kind of that 40 yard dash isometric position where I'm going to keep that bent. I'm going to try and put my heel on the ground and I'm going to bring it up a tiny bit and you will feel things load all the way through your chain. I, mean, th I think we can all agree that you have to have good isometric strength to punch someone like Ken was doing last night. Shouldn't we have that same isometric strength if we're hitting the ground that hard at these different angles? Now if you want to get crazy, you can also go off an edge and just work on that ball, that big toe. If you watch really good sprinters come out of the hole, they are on this part of their foot most for the first four steps. And if we're following that idea that isometrically you have to be strong there, shouldn't we train that? So we call these edges. And we can change that ankle angle again. Pretty simple, right? So what we do after we do RPR is we're up against the wall, we're doing our isometric strengths because I want that to be a priority in what we do. And if you want to get crazier when you're in the weight room, you can do your, all your isometric stuff and I've, I've gone to doing this now and I don't do it the other way anymore because it completely changes how the exercise feels and you can feel that your whole body tense up which is what I want. I want that tension in the whole body when you're on the ground. We'll go off a plate when we do our split squats. And now if you look at that research, that accounts for all those angles that we're looking for. And it feels very different. It feels very different. Cal and I got into it where he goes, no, I'm just putting my foot on the ground and we're raising up a little bit. I said, all right, Cal, try it with your foot up. No, I'm good. He's not even here to defend himself. He went back to go sleep somewhere. I guarantee he's sleeping in some corner in this building. <laughs> but you put that plate down and you pu push it up, it holds. I mean, it changes the exercise. And all of a sudden you feel a ton in your hamstring and a lot more in your butt. How many people want to do their exercises and get their butt and hamstring really good and make them really strong? Right? It makes a big difference. Show you how much of a difference it made. Uh, who's a distance coach here? You guys can sit now. This is Ryan Clevenger. He was a 403 miler here at high school at Donners Grove North back in the day. He's going into his senior year at Wisconsin where he runs. They've done a great job wrecking him. He has to come home every summer and get fixed and then go back and get wrecked again. Uh, this was him a couple weeks ago coming back, say, all right, coach, I really got to do it this year. And so I said, Ryan, all I want you to do this week is just do the isometric ankle stuff and see what happens. So here's his toe off pre and here's his toe off post. Can you guys see the greater knee drive? Slightly better form and technique. So I wanted to see, he became my guinea pig. I just wanted to see if we really jacked up, really strengthened through his ankle and foot complex, if he's going to run better. And if knee height, if knee lift is a response to some extent, bouncing that foot off the ground coming up, we see an improvement here. Yeah? How long will you do the ISO holds for? Time. So Ryan is a typical OCD distance runner, so whatever I tell him to do, he'll do, and so we did every hour, and he did. 60 seconds? Yeah, we started for 60 seconds. <coughs> he didn't run anything. He didn't do anything else. I said, Ryan, let's just do ISOs this week and see what happens. Can you repeat that? You said every hour, so... Every hour. Every hour he'd stop what he's doing, and you know how distance guys are, they got their crazy watches with their <laughs> laps and all the other stuff, and the thing probably went off, and he probably went... <laughs> 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 Can you do the 
you're not looking for progression from there, you're just looking for accumulation over time? So uh, you're looking for, as you're developing into skills, you go skill acquisition to endurance to strength. So this is just an endurance phase so we can start weighting him down. And, that's, and we got that kind of change immediately, which is kind of cool. You see, once I go down these wormholes, everyone becomes my guinea pig. They just don't know it. Chris, was it each of those three progressions? So six minutes every hour? Because it's Ryan, I guarantee he did all three. Yeah? On the slide before that where you had him on the plate, was that a 25 pound like rubber plate? I don't know what it was. It's, uh, at Hinsdale Central, we have the mega bumper plates. So everything's the same size, mega big. So I don't know the actual amount, but it, it's high. I'm guessing it was, you know, it's the typical bumper plate, about three inches. But at home, uh, the flops, you guys know those flops that Sornex sells? They're those mats. I can't buy enough of those because we can do all kinds of stuff off of those. And they're perfect for any of these things, and they're cheap. They're cheaper than a plate. So, we can get the isometric strength, but how are we going to make it even stronger? We're going to work our co-contraction. This was some early research with ankles and co-contractions. They really didn't use the word co-contractions, but basically tendon stiffness is tuned in to optimize fiber shortening velocity and minimize muscle activation. So the tendon wants to do most of the work. The role of distal muscles may therefore not be directly perform work but to modulate the power and production of proximal muscles by functioning as a tunable series of elasticity of the tendon. So basically what they want to have happen is when that foot hits the ground, everything tightens up to protect itself. You guys know where they came up with this research? It's called a stumble reflex. And at the spinal cord level, because falling happens so quick and you want to protect yourself so you can get up and run away from the grizzly bear, your body learns to tighten itself in the gait. And where they got this research is they tripped cats. 1979, H. Forsberg has a thing against cats. And he was tripping kitties. I've had 22 cats. I've liked one of them. My wife likes them. It's hard. I've tried for years to trip those damn things. <laughs> and that's where they found out this whole co-contraction thing. So, this is getting into overspeed stuff. I'm going to come back to that. How are we going to make that co-contraction work even better? How are we going to challenge that co-contraction to make it more efficient to tighten up that ankle so we get more energy through that tendon and we can get more of that 75% back? Um, here's, we use bands. So pulling you down faster off the edge. I know that's not very dynamic and, and thrilling, but you do that for a couple recs. I, I have it looped here. It burns. But what's awesome is when kids walk away from that exercise, they go, man, I feel great. I feel really springy. And that's what we want in a workout, right? We want them to walk away feeling great instead of, man, you wrecked me. Take me three days to recover from this. Are they just standing under like a barbell? No, they have, uh, we have the straps over your shoulders. Okay. And then they're just popping? Yeah, they're popping. Here we are at Montini doing boom booms with the same thing, working on keeping that footstep off the ground. You see, that's what I have to deal with. So here's this great exercise uh, that really deals with muscle slack in the ankle and really forces the co-contraction. I have about two flops here, so that's about three inches up. And so when you jump onto a platform, your body doesn't have time to reload and gather. So it's true, the true energy of what you have in that foot. And once you hit, you bounce up onto the higher box. And sure enough, to a T, my distance runners, this is about what they can do. My really springy guys, and I got some really good guys this summer, uh, you can jack that thing way up and their foot is like a spring.
And then, looking at overspeed. Should I flip this, Ken? Is this too much? Uh, Ken, Mikhail, who's this cool Irish guy who says brilliant all the time, just like every other Irish guy you would imagine would. In fact, sometimes I tried to trick him into saying, brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> Uh, we had a bunch of 34 athletes come to Hinsdale Central to kind of look into this kind of stuff. And this is kind of how we set it up. And we were looking at contact times. And this is one, I, th I can skip this because I'm running out of time here. I th Ken showed this last night. Should I skip it? No, I heard one no. No. This is with a really cool slow motion camera that does, what, 960 feet per second. I thought it was so cool that I bought it myself, and I don't know how to work it. <laughs> it's more bad advice you're getting from me. I was all set to do this with all my athletes after Ken did it, and I completely botched it. But I got this cool camera. It sits in a case, and my wife gives me shit about it. <laughs> Where's that camera? She'll start taking cat videos. <laughs> <laughs> so now what I do, I have dogs that like to harass the cats, and that's my actual thing. So he, this was, uh, here he is pulled running 11.24 meters per second. It was fun. That was a fun two days. It was really interesting. I learned a lot. So if you listen to Charlie Francis where he says the foot strike's gonna be out in front and all that, we didn't see that happen with any of our 34 athletes. So we had a, a good spectrum. Uh, we had some good girls, we had some decent girls, we had some really good guys. What, what was the most that you towed? What per, percent over or, or a meter over? How, how I think we ended up towing about 10% over. Yeah, with the competitive sprinters, it was 10% body mass pull for a 10% speed bump. So, like for him, 11.2 in, in a practice setting is incredible. And so we saw no pre-foot strike. No heel strike, nobody tried to decelerate their body. They went with it, and as Ken said last night, none of those people had been towed previously. You, they literally came in, they had to go through the formal warm-up, which I thought was kind of funny because we actually had to do it, and that was, became a thing in the paper. But then they did a fly 10, two assisted, and then came back with a fly 10. And what was even cooler was the fact that the fatigue rate was about identical for everyone, that everyone had the same fatigue rate at the end of those four sprints, which I thought was really interesting. But what was even cooler is three days later, a bunch of those guys went and ran at uh, regionals up in DeKalb, and it was with a TNT. The guys that came and did the overspeed research all set PRs in the 100 and 200 meter dash at 8 in the morning in DeKalb which I went to Northern Illinois at 8 in the morning to Cal, but it's also known as hell. <laughs> and then the guys who didn't get, do the overspeed training did not run very well. Chris, was there any difference in ankle stiffness in the pool on this part of the So, yeah, thanks for coming late and wrecking it for everyone. Um, <laughs> the ground contact times were decreased for everyone. Yeah, so... Measuring ankle stiffness with just kind of the video methods that we use was going to be hard to do, but it, per Chris's comment, everybody was on and off the ground faster when they were running at the higher velocities right. when they were pulled. So it kind of, I don't know, you can definitely speculate about what they had to do from a stiffness standpoint to be able to handle that as so they were from running. From a neural standpoint, Absolutely. the body's protection mechanism could have kicked in and be more stiff. That's right, that's the part you missed. Thanks for making me repeat it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I got lost. I don't know if I believe that. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe it.